a very good evening to one and all hope everybody is fine and uh, doing well today uh, we have another expert talk on uh, forensics the science behind the death of the famous people i guess many of you must have uh, heard about this this is a famous book written by harry a melman sir so uh, on the behalf of sifs india i uh, asin tarun welcome everyone and harry sir for today's session a warm welcome from my side harry sir and uh, i'll request uh, my co-host asha verma to give a uh, like enlightened uh, introduction for harry sir good evening everyone good evening dr anjit singh sir and a very warm welcome to dr harry a melman sir we are happy and grateful to have you among us let me introduce you uh, to my audience so that they can have an insight about your doings harry a melman sir is a consulting pharmacologist toxicologist and an expert witness with over 40 years of experience at the us environmental protection agency us national cancer institute national institute of health and us public health service he has assisted in over 300 civil criminal and high profile legal cases and has testified at trials and depositions he has authored over 70 scientific articles has edited five science books and has appeared as a toxicological expert on television and radio news programs and in true crime television shows he is the author of forensics the science behind the deaths of famous people which is the title of our today's expert talk session and two award winning novels a death at camp david and soyuz the final flight over to you sir thank you so much astha for introducing our esteemed speaker harry wilman and i'm fortunate enough to have his book and i'm reading the book it's a it's a very good book and i recommend all the participant you must buy the book and so that you can learn more and more about the death uh, like uh, forensic behind the death of the famous people over to you sir well good, uh, good evening to you good morning to me on the east coast in in washington dc thank you very much for the invitation uh, i very much appreciate it Uh, I'd like to make this uh, presentation very informal. So, if anybody has questions, you can interrupt me uh, at certain points, and uh, and you know, and, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So, um, I know you have many students uh, who are uh, watching today. So, I, I first want to present a little bit about my background and how how I arrived uh, to where I am today, and then we'll talk about uh, some examples from my book about. the death of famous people and then if we have it some time uh, i'll give you some examples of uh, specific cases that i assisted attorneys in in litigation and you can see how forensics and toxicology in my which is my background uh, come into play in in uh, real life um, uh, trials so um so so let's begin so If you asked me back in high school what do you want to do when you grow up, I would have said uh, electrical engineer. I was good in math. I liked electricity, and uh, and I thought I was going to be electrical engineer. Uh, but life takes you in mysterious ways, and I wound up in the biological sciences. So how does that happen? And and, and I and I bring that up because many students, you know, they they don't know what they want to do with their with their career. So. I my my bottom line for that is um what I always tell people go with the flow keep your eyes and ears open see the uh, seize the opportunities as they arise and uh, and then see where it takes you because what you think you want to do today may not be what actually happens tomorrow mainly because if you want to be a, for example a, in forensics uh if you can't get a job in forensics you will not be in forensics so in my case for example uh like i said i i, I wanted to be an electrical engineer but my parents had other ideas so uh they put me in pharmacy school and so after uh, so i became uh so i, I went to uh, college for pharmacy uh, five years and then after that i had uh, a masters in uh, in pharmacy so uh which was two more years so and during that time i also worked in 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 pharmacies and drug stores uh 
and I uh, and that experience made me realize one that I was not interested in, in working in a drugstore for the rest of my life, and two, having a master's, I, I knew I was interested in research. So, uh, so after my master's, what I wanted to do was to get a job in research. So after uh, after my master's, I worked for two years in a pharmacy. Um, uh, a government pharmacy, and then uh, in the meantime, I was applying for jobs, and I found the job finally after two years. I found a job, pretty much what I wanted, even though I didn't know that's what I wanted. And the job was uh, at the National Cancer Institute, the National Institutes of Health here in Bethesda, Maryland, and uh, working in the laboratory of toxicology, doing toxicology, pharmacology biochemistry, laboratory research on drugs to treat uh, cancer, primarily leukemia and pancreatic cancer. So, by, so it was just a matter of a lot of perseverance, working hard, trying to get a job, uh, finding a mentor, and I, f I finally got it. And when I got the job at the National Cancer Institute, and I was there for 10 years, uh, within about six months, they decided that I was PhD material. So they decided to send me for a PhD program in pharmacology at George Washington University here in Washington, DC. And uh, which is like um, maybe an hour away from my job. So, and I, and I worked it out with my boss because many, many times the courses were downtown and, and the, you know, during working hours. So, so I would have to make up the hours on the weekends and in the evenings. So we, we, we figured it out. And then seven years later, I got a PhD in pharmacology. And I did my thesis on the job. And my job paid for my schooling. So basically, I figured, well, if they're going to do all that for me, the, and the only thing I have to do is, is study, then why not? I'll, I'll do it, even though it would be a very difficult situation, because I went to school full time and also worked full time. So seven years later, I got my PhD, and then I, I got a, a different job at NIH uh, for another two, three years. And now 10 years later, I switched to the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, where I was there for 18 years. So by the time I finished my 30 year career in the government, I was basically a toxicology and cancer expert. I published five scientific books, I have many scientific papers, and I didn't know what I wanted to do now. Uh, so I worked, I, I uh, participated in some activities for my Society of Toxicology, uh, uh, the Society of Toxicology, my local chapter. And two years later, somebody recommended me to testify in a trial. Uh, I liked the experience. I set up a website uh, with my background and my resume, and then lawyers, attorneys, advocates, all over the country, as well as Australia and Canada, found me on the web, and uh, they would, you know, contact me. And now, for 23 years, I've been an expert witness in trials as a toxicology and cancer expert, as well as pharmacology and pharmacy. So, in the course of doing that, 350 cases, I assist in the 350 cases. About 10% actually go to trial. Uh, I did criminal and civil. About 10%, 15% was criminal, and those usually do go to trial. But the other 85%, the civil cases, many, and most often they uh, settle before trial. But nevertheless, there's a lot of work to be done before settlement. Uh, you go through depositions, you have to testify under oath, you have to prepare reports, you have to review documents. So now, uh, so this is where we are today. At, 23 years later as an expert witness in trials. <clears throat> uh, in the course, now about, about seven years ago, while I'm still uh, testifying, I, uh, <clears throat> I came up with, a, with an idea for my first book. Um, it's called A Death at Camp David, A Death at Camp David. It's a mystery and I, and I decided to have a, the main character, a, a forensic toxicologist, so I can take my whole background and experience and put it into the main character. And, I, and that, that experience of writing a, a mystery novel, that took two and a half years to do. And at the end of two and a half years, I said, thank God it's over. 
I did my part. I thought it was going to be my one and only book. It was just too much work. But I had my first book signing event in, in one of the big uh, bookstores here in the United States called Barnes and Noble. And I sold out and people were asking me, what are you going to write next? And I didn't have any plans to write anything next. And they told me, well, you can't do just one. You got to write a sick, uh, you got to write another one. And so now I had to write a second one and I did, I, uh, which is called Soyuz, The Final Flight. Again, the same main character, the forensic toxicologist, but this time it's a science fiction space exploration thriller. And so now I have two books and, and I'm still testifying and all that. And obviously my time is very limited. And, uh, and now I wrote two books and the third, and then I went to India. I visited India two times, I think I mentioned earlier. And I got some ideas about a story and, to be uh, located in India. And it, my next book was going to be called Murder at the Taj Mahal. Murder at the Taj Mahal. So again, with the same forensic toxicologist as the main character. So I, um, <clears throat> I wrote about 30% of, of, of that book. <clears throat> and then one day on the news, uh, I hear that Carrie, Carrie Fisher you all know Carrie Fisher from Star Wars. Uh, she was Princess Leia in Star Wars. That that she had a medical emergency aboard a plane, uh, and then and then the plane landed. She went to the hospital. Three days later, she died. And uh, <clears throat> the the coroner uh, determined the medical ex examiner determined that Carrie Fisher died from sleep apnea that the cause of death was sleep apnea. And uh, I didn't know that sleep apnea uh, can actually kill you because uh, sleep apnea, for those of you who do not know, it's, uh, uh, you know, you stop breathing for five, 10 seconds, uh, but then you wake up and uh, there are very way, various ways to uh, cope with that. But the, the point is that you do wake up. So, um, so here he indicated that, and she was suffering from sleep apnea for some time, so it was nothing new. So, but, but on the other hand, we all knew that uh, Carrie Fisher was a drug addict. She, she's admitted that herself and many, many times. So I suspected that she died from a drug overdose, but here she, uh, the coroner said that she died from sleep apnea. And not only that, uh, the coroner did not uh, do an autopsy because the family refused to do an autopsy. So all that didn't sound right to me. And so I looked further into her death and then that gave me an idea to look further into other celebrity deaths. And that's how my latest book came about. Uh, uh, forensics, can, can, forensics, the science behind the deaths of famous people. So this book uh, is about eight months old now, and uh, it's, it's available on Amazon uh, in India, and uh, it's certainly available in PDF or Kindle uh, over there. And uh, many times you can also order it soft cover or hard cover. It's also available on, on other, uh, other online stores like Kobo, uh, iTunes, and, and other places. So I looked over, I looked at, uh, does anybody have any questions at the moment before we move on? Okay, <clears throat> so, um, so let's talk about uh, Carrie Fisher for a moment. Um, so I, as I said, we all know Carrie Fisher from Star Wars. She had a medical emergency aboard the plane. That's the way they described it. Later, uh, some people suggested that she had a heart attack. Others, uh, the hospital said she did not have a heart attack. Um, there was no real explanation uh, what, what actually happened, but three days later, um, she died in the, in the hospital. So, so now the coroner, the coroner has determined two things. One of them is the cause of death. 
The cause of death, uh, again, many of you probably know, but I'll, I'll just go over it anyway. The cause of death is a biological scientific explanation for why a person died. For example, they died from a heart attack, they died from uh, uh, you know, respiratory depression, a neurological problem. It's a real scientific explanation for why a person died. Uh, usually there's no, uh, uh, there's no argument with, uh, with, with the determination of the cause of death. It's usually accepted. Uh, there's usually no, uh, no, no errors in, in that analysis. The other part uh, that the carna determines is the manner of death. Now the manner of death is, has uh, five categories. It could be a natural death. Uh, you know, a person just died of old age, for example. It could be an accident, accidental. It could be homicide, it could be suicide. And when none of these uh, categories fit the circumstances, it could be undetermined. It, it would be listed as undetermined. At least in the United States, that's, that's the term that they use, undetermined. Um, so the manner of death is a medical legal interpretation of the circumstances surrounding the death, as well as the scientific information and everything that you know about this, about what happened. And then you come up, and then the coroner comes up with some sort of a conclusion uh, for the manner of death that fits into one of these five categories. Now you can see that uh, one person can interpret it as, I'm not talking about in Carrie Fisher's case, but in general, one can, person can say it was a suicide and somebody else can say it was a homicide. They can look at the same exact information and they come, come to two different conclusions. Whereas on the cause of death, it's, it's very scientific and based on facts. So there's hardly ever any, uh, and the, any discrepancy in, in the evaluation there. So when, you, when you're reading the newspapers and magazines and all the tabloids, when they're talking about, when, when they discuss you know, a celebrity death and, 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 and any problems associated with that, they always talk about the manner of death. Oh, it could, you know, somebody killed him or, you know, it, 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 wasn't, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't an accident, it was, it, it, it must have been, and I'll give you some examples later, but it must have been a, a homicide. Uh, and, and they usually do not back it up with, with facts. It's just, um, it's just intuition, intuition. And that's where, that's where the conspiracy theories come in the area of manner of death, but not in the area of cause of death. And for forensics, and forensic scientists, we deal with uh, cause of death. The manner of death is a is a interpretation of every of all the information, but it's subject to, since it's an interpretation, it's also subject to bias by different people. So, let's talk about again about Carrie Fisher. So, in Carrie Fisher, she had the medical emergency. Three days later, she died in the hospital. Now that the coroner has to determine how did, she, how did she die? What was the cause of death? What was the manner of death? Okay, so for the cause of death, uh, um, usually what you do, you, you, you do an autopsy, and then you also do uh, toxicology analysis, blood and urine and and, and tissues if necessary and, and, and hair follicles and basically measure, scientific measurements. But the family refused to give uh, consent for an autopsy to be done, which basically means that one, he, the, they couldn't do an autopsy, they couldn't cut, cut up the body to look at the internal organs and they couldn't take any samples like blood or urine, for example. And why is that? Well, we don't know why the family refused. If you read my book, I gave you a few a few reasons why I, I think it could have it, it could have been. But that being aside, um, 
first of all, she died three days after her medical emergency on the plane, and, and she died in the hospital. So it, this was not a suspicious death because she died in the hospital. If it was a suspicious death, the, uh, the you know, the, uh, for example, it, it could have been a homicide, well, then the family cannot refuse. It, it all automatically, be, an autopsy will be done. But in this case, it was not a suspicious death. So the family has the option not to give permission for an autopsy, and that's what they chose to do. So the coroner now, his hands are a little bit tied because he can't do an autopsy and he can't uh, take any blood or urine samples to figure out what happened. So, so he did the next best thing that he could do. Uh, for the autopsy, and since he couldn't cut up the body, he did a CAT, a CAT scan. As you know, a CAT scan is kind of like an x-ray uh, of the body. And uh, so it doesn't, you don't open up the body, but you kind of look, you look inside through, uh, through Im imaging. Uh, it's not as good as opening up the body, but nevertheless, uh, it gives you a kind of a gross uh, examination of the internal organs to see if there are any lumps and bumps, if you will. And, uh, and, and basically there was nothing unusual about the internal organs. The, the heart had some mild atherosclerosis, but not enough to cause a heart attack. Um, there was nothing else that was unusual in the, uh, in the internal organs to suggest uh, a, a cause of death. Okay, so the next, so that didn't help. So the next thing is uh, he had to, uh, you know, the next thing was a toxicology analysis. But um, like, as I mentioned, uh, the, even if he got blood and urine at autopsy, at the time of the autopsy, that was, uh, that was when she died, but, but the actual incidents occurred three days earlier on the, aboard the plane. And at that moment, you know, if it was drug related, for, if that incident, for example, a medical emergency was drug related, any drugs that were in her system at that, you know, on board the plane, three days later, most of it, if any, if, if, if most of, it, if not all of it would be gone. So, so any blood and urine collected at autopsy wouldn't have been, very, most likely would not have been very helpful anyway, uh, because it was three or four days after the actual medical emergency. But that said, you know, he couldn't take blood and urine. So, uh, so he did the next best, best thing. He, he, uh, he requested uh, blood and urine samples from the hospital because in the hospital, they take blood and urine for their own purposes. Uh, for treatment, for example, they want to make sure that there's not, nothing that will interfere with the treatment. So in the hospital, they took some blood, some blood and urine, but they used most of it, and there was a, only a little bit left, which they can give then to the coroner. And so it wasn't sufficient to do all the testing that, that he needed to do. So just for example, <clears throat> uh, and, and you may all know this already, but just for example, when you, when you do toxicology testing, it's usually a two-step two step process. Uh, the first step is kind of a, uh, an immunotoxicology screen. Um, it's, a, it's, a quick, it's a quick assay method uh, that <clears throat> tells you the presence or absence of, uh, let's say, drugs of abuse, but it doesn't quantify, and it's subject to uh, false negatives and false positives. Okay. However, so for, just for example, uh, as I indicated, uh, as I indicated, he took he took a um, he received some blood samples from from the hospital. They did a uh, an immunotoxicology screen. They found the presence of opioids, but. Opioids is a class of chemicals, of drugs, and uh, so it didn't identify which opioid, and it also didn't quantify, and of course, it's subject to false negatives and false positives, but it kind of gives you a, a, a glimpse of what could be present in the blood, so the next step normally would be uh, a confirmatory test, which is uh, very specific, and it also quantifies, and in this case, it would have been a, a what, what we call gastro 
uh, uh, not gastro, uh, GC mass spec, uh, GC mass spec uh, confirmatory test, uh, which, which is a very highly specific, expensive, time consuming uh, analysis, but it's very, but it's specific and it quantifies, but it couldn't do it because there wasn't enough sample. So, so, so basically what he found, so basically he, he had some, some blood and urine samples from the hospital. He was able to test uh, a first test, but not a second. He, he was able to identify the presence of uh, uh, opioids in the blood. And he was also able to identify some in the urine, some uh, also in the blood was a metabolite of cocaine. And, and it was also able to identify in the urine some alcohol and some, uh, some metabolites of other drugs, you know, pharmaceuticals uh, that, that whose contribution to her death is unknown because again, it was in the urine. So, I, so just to be clear, to, 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 uh, to arrive at cause of death, you need Ideally, in terms of toxicology, ideally what you want is a blood sample, not a urine. And I'll tell you why in a second. You want a blood sample and you want to be able to identify and quantify. And based on that, you can figure out that at that specific amount of, let's say, uh, morphine in the blood, you expect these kind of effects. Uh, was it an overdose or, or not? Urine only tells you uh, as you know, urine is outside of the body. So uh, it only tells you about uh, that this drug that was found in the urine was present in the body at some point was administered, but you don't know when it was taken or administered or how much was given, how much was consumed. So the presence of any drugs in the urine does not really help you with the cause of death. It just indicates past past usage, but it doesn't tell you how much or when. So past usage in her situation was uh, some uh, pharmaceuticals uh, that, she, that she was taking and, and the metabolites, like I said, there was a metabolite of, the, there was opioids in the blood, but we couldn't identify or quantify. And there was a metabolite of cocaine, which again, uh, it's nice to know, but the metabolite is not the active ingredient. So you need, really need to assay for cocaine itself. And you couldn't do that because there wasn't enough blood to do it. And as far as the uh, metabol, as far as the opioids, he, he, didn't he couldn't identify what it was uh, because again, there wasn't enough sample. Now they did find another, metab they did find another metabolite in the vitreous humor of the eye uh, which is the gel-like material behind the lens of the eye. And that metabolite was a metabolite of, uh, of heroin, uh, the second metabolite of heroin. So with that information that it was the second metabolite of heroin in the, uh, the uh, vitreous humor of the eye, the assumption is that the opioids in the blood was morphine, which is the primary metabolite of heroin. But again, that's the assumption. It wasn't, met, it wasn't identified you know, by, by GC mass spec uh, confirmatory tests and it, it wasn't quantified. So, and also we don't know if there was any, uh, we're not able to figure out whether there's any cocaine, un, uh, unmetabolized cocaine in, in the blood because again, there was not enough sample to be tested. So take, taking all this information together, there's, uh, and as a forensic toxicologist, this is what you tend to do. And that is you look at the autopsy and, and basically you couldn't do an autopsy, but the, the CAT scans uh, did not identify anything abnormal in the, in the organs and on the blood and on the toxicology side, there were a lot of, a lot of sh uh, shortages because uh, we couldn't do enough testing. Uh, so you couldn't say anything whether she was taking an overdose or whether it was a drug-drug uh, combination effect or, 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 you know, or what she even, you know, probably she took uh, heroin at some point, but we don't know when. 
And uh, so there's a lot of questions in, on the toxicology side, be, primarily because and, uh, the, you know, sufficient testing could not be done, be, again, because the family refused to give permission for an autopsy and toxicology testing to be done. All right, any questions so far? So, <clears throat> so now the coroner has to make a decision of, uh, cause of death and manner of death. So on the cause of death, he, he doesn't really have much choices, but he has, to, he has to decide what the cause of death is. So he cannot say, for example, the guidelines for cause of death do not allow him to, do not give him permission to just say, you know, she died from, because her heart stopped, for example, you know? So, <clears throat> so he, he cannot say that. So he has to come up with a, a disease process, if you will, that caused, <clears throat> excuse me, caused her death. So, um, so by process of elimination and recognizing all the deficiencies in the analysis, he, 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 and he knew that she had sleep apnea, she was suffering from sleep apnea and that she had some sleep apnea episodes aboard the plane, he concluded that the cause of death was sleep apnea. It may not be correct if had he done the toxicology and he would have seen that, for example, that she took an overdose, but, but that information was not available. So he could not come to that conclusion. So he had to conclude based on the information that he already had. And that is by process of elimination, he came up with the sleep apnea as the cause of her death. But on the matter of death, he, he labeled it undetermined primarily because he didn't have all the information that he needed in order to identify whether, for example, whether it was an accidental death because she took an overdose uh, or, or, or a suicide or what. So all because he didn't have sufficient information. So he labeled her manner of death undetermined and the cause of death, sleep apnea. And obviously there are a lot of questions in the, in the in the final conclusion, uh, but that's what it is. Any any questions so far? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea about <clears throat> one case about uh, you know how forensics comes into the picture. I'll give you another example from, from the book, and, and that would be, let's say, Marilyn Monroe. We all know Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe is a beautiful blonde actress. <clears throat> so there was so I, there was one day. She, there was one day um, <clears throat> when she was home alone. Uh, well. When she was home, I should say, not, I shouldn't say alone, her, her, her housekeeper was home, but um, she was home making phone calls until about seven o'clock at night. And um, sometime during the, during the middle of the night, her housekeeper woke up about three o'clock in the morning or so. Her housekeeper woke up and she saw that there was a light under Marilyn Monroe's uh, door. She tried to open the door, she couldn't, and she, uh, she couldn't you know, the door was locked from the inside. She called out for Marilyn Monroe and she didn't answer. So the housekeeper uh, called up Marilyn Monroe's um, doctor who, who came right away, uh, broke a, a bedroom window, went, came, went into the bedroom through the window and found Marilyn Monroe dead on the bed. So, um, so now, first of all, some people say uh, she was murdered and specifically by the, the president of the United States or his brother, mainly because uh, she, had, uh, she had affairs with, with both of them, apparently. There was also a question about um, the mob, you know, uh, crime, crime people, uh, that they may have been involved. Um, none of that is true, in my opinion, uh, and, and many others. <clears throat> Why? <clears throat> so first of all, how, whether she died from 
homicide like that, that's a manner of death question, right? I, point, I pointed out homicide is a manner of death. And it, to conclude on the manner of death, uh, well, okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. But in Barry Monroe's case, she, she did have an autopsy. Excuse me one second. In Marilyn Monroe's case, she did have an autopsy and, um, and they found high levels, you know, overdose levels of uh, two, two, uh, two drugs, uh, two sleeping pills that happened to be, have been on her nightstand. So on, on her nightstand, there was one, one bottle of, uh, of nembutile, you know, a barbiturate that was completely empty, and another one of chloral hydrate that was about half empty or so, maybe three quarters empty. Both of them are tranquilizers, sleeping pills, okay? And those two drugs were found in overdose range in her system, in her blood. Um, and, okay, so, so the conclusion, so, so one, she, she, she had two drugs in a system that uh, at least one, if not both, were in the overdose range. They both are sleeping pills, so they, so their pharmacology and toxicology actually combines uh, as opposed to, so, so taking two is worse than taking just one. Um, so, and then, the, and then the question, one of the question was, well, how did she, uh, how did those drugs wind up in her system? So some people who, who are, who are suggesting uh, it was a, a, hom a homicide, that uh, she was murdered. Some people say, well, she was injected uh, with the drugs and at autopsy, they went over her body with a magnifying glass and they didn't find any injection sites. So, so there was no injection site on her body, uh, which suggest, which strongly indicated that uh, she, the drugs came by ingestion. Uh, she, she had the, the pills on her, on her nightstand. The bottles were empty now. Uh, so, she, so she had to take them orally there's no evidence that she was injected. There's no evidence that they were forced into her body, you know, that somebody forced fed her with those pills. The, her, her room was locked from the inside and it was, obviously there was nobody else in the room. She had also um, tried to commit suicide in the same manner in the past whenever she was uh, depressed. Um, so it was not unusual for her to, uh, to tr you know, to try to commit suicide by taking an overdose of pills. In the past, uh, in the past, she you know she called and 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 she was people came in time and they rescued her uh, from the overdose. But in this situation, uh, that didn't happen, so it was too late. And she, if you will, she succeeded in committing suicide. Um, Whereas in the past she, she did not because she was rescued. So <clears throat> the, uh, the the likelihood that it was a homicide it's it's very unlikely, and that it was a suicide it's very likely because the, the pills were right there. There were the same pills that, or the same medication was in her system. It was in the overdose range. There was no evidence of of forced entry. There was no evidence of um, injection sites. She must have taken it orally. Um, so uh, after all is said and done, the the conclusion was um, the cause of death was the drug overdose. The manner of death was suicide. And I should point out also uh, there was there was no uh, suicide note, which which would kind of have clinched it, if you will. But the uh, the um, uh, coroner, before he before he concluded that it was a suicide, he um, he he uh, he organized a group of psychiatrists and psychologists to look over all the information 
and as well as the past uh, incidents of her su uh, suicide attempts. And they in turn concluded and made the recommendation based on, on all that evidence that it was a suicide, that, that previously she tried it and was rescued. This time she tried it and, and, and she succeeded, if you will. So taking all that information, uh, the, the coroner then concluded that it was a suicide and the manner of death was a drug overdose with barbiturates. Any questions? Okay, so I'll give you one more example from the book. There are 23 uh, famous people in the book. Uh, each one of them is discussed in uh, pretty much the way I'm talking to you now and telling you now. Um, often the science as well as the uh, biography of the individuals and the conclusions. So, and, and for anybody who is not a scientist, it's easy reading and all the science is very clearly understandable because I purposely wrote it for the non-scientists, not necessarily for the scientists. So I know you like it. It's available on Amazon, hardcover, softcover, as well as Kindle or PDF uh, uh, on Amazon India, as well as many other online bookstores. <clears throat> so now I'll give you the third example from the book. And, uh, <clears throat> and that would be Michael Jackson. So Michael, excuse me, Michael Jackson, we all know Michael Jackson. Anybody doesn't know Michael Jackson? I, so we all know Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, when, when you see him on, you know, uh, on TV or on stage, or, you know, very energetic, uh, individual dancing, singing, jumping around, very, you know, very hyper. Um, what, one thing you don't know, because, because this is the entertainment world, you know, what you see is not necessarily what you get. So, so you see a very energetic young uh, person, but at autopsy, I, I always say at autopsy, uh, you find out that these people are very much like the rest of us. They suffer from the same problems that the rest of us do. Uh, you, you, you don't know that when you see them on stage, but when you look at the autopsy and you find out that they have, a, you know, a, a prostate problem in men, you know, or the women have uh, uh, women problems, you know, you find out all that on, at the autopsy and you find out that basically they're just like the rest of us. So Michael Jackson, like I said, was, it was, this is, he was scheduled to, uh, to appear in, in London, uh, 50 sold out concerts. So he had this, uh, this one night, he had this last rehearsal in, uh, in an auditorium in California in anticipation of these 50 sold out concerts in, uh, in London. <clears throat> so everything was going great. He was dancing, he was jumping, he was singing, everything wonderful. And then he, uh, he drove home <clears throat> and waiting for him at home <clears throat> was his personal, uh, in, you know, in the driveway was his personal uh, doctor. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> which was not unusual. Now just, uh, just to let you know, uh, what, as I'm sure you all know, when you're when you're uh, in, in his case, for example, when he's performing like that in, in, in dress rehearsal, it was a lot of jumping, a lot of hyper, you know, the adrenaline and rush, you know, it takes. And then you come home at midnight, one o'clock in the morning. You, you know, you can't really necessarily go to sleep right away, right? Because you're very, you know, you're very hyper. You, you, you know, you're still you know, you're still very active uh, internally. Uh, the adrenaline is pumping. You really have to give your, your body a chance to, uh, to calm down before you can fall asleep. 
Um, in, my, <clears throat> in Michael Jackson's case, <clears throat> a, a lot of times, you know, you, you know, they have maybe another show tomorrow morning. So now it's one o'clock, two o'clock, you know, he doesn't have time to, to calm down because tomorrow he has to another show or something like that. So, so what happens? Um, they, they try to get some pharmaceutical help in order to uh, fall asleep. So in, in Michael Jackson's case, he had his personal physician who met him at the driveway and Michael Jackson immediately asks him um, to give him some propofol. Propofol is a uh, intravenous anesthetic that is that his doctor has given them in the past. It's usually given uh, in a hospital situation for surgery. So as, as you can imagine, it's, uh, it's a medication that puts you, that knocks you out in time for surgery, you know, within a minute or two, right? It's given intravenously, knocks you out for surgery. And then, and then, you know, later after the surgery, you wake up, but it doesn't really put you to sleep because being knocked out like that is not necessarily the same as falling asleep. Uh, you know, in terms of the REM sleep, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with REM sleep, but at any rate, uh, this doctor has been giving Michael Jackson in the past uh, this propofol and he was requesting it now. Uh, the doctor apparently was um, reluctant to give him propofol. So he first gave him some, <clears throat> some oral, uh, oral uh, barbiturate <clears throat> tranquilizer. <clears throat> so he gave him a tablet or two, and then, uh, you know, half an hour, an hour later, Michael Jackson is still not sleeping. So he gave him an, another dose. And then later he gave him a different drug and, and, and you know, all barbiturates and tranquilizers. And, and over the next two, three hours, he gave him like, uh, you know, maybe six different doses of these two tranquilizers. And Michael Jackson is still not falling asleep. So then he gave him, he finally gave in and he gave Michael Jackson this intravenous propofol um, in his bedroom, not in the hospital, but in his bedroom. Um, and Michael Jackson, you know, was knocked out. And during that time period, the doctor went next door um, to make a phone call. He, he, he testified later, he, later, he, uh, <clears throat> he, he was accused of, uh, of, um, homicide. <clears throat> and, uh, and I'll explain that in a minute, but he, he, he said he only went to, went out of the room for a few minutes, but in fact, it was a, it was a half an hour. And the way, and the way they know that is because they monitored his, uh, his telephone calls, and and they and they saw that it was he was gone for about a half an hour. So, um, so when he comes back, Michael Jackson uh, is not breathing; he was basically dead. So, on the table in his house, and and because it was not in a hospital situation, uh, the doctor didn't have the resuscitation equipment necessary. And uh, he tried CPR and all that, but nothing helped. Michael Jackson was taken by ambulance to the hospital, but he was declared dead. He was 50 years old. <clears throat> and, and, late, <clears throat> and later, the autopsy <clears throat> showed that he had all these various drugs in his system. And all these drugs, the barbiturates and the propofol, they're all central nervous system depressant drugs. So taken together, uh, you know, you were in the overdose range because they all, the combination of the pharmacology and toxicology of all these drugs is worse than taking each one of them alone. So he, he had these several drugs plus the propofol. And so he, uh, he died from, from basically from a drug overdose. <clears throat> so, the, so the doctor, uh, you know, was, was, uh, he, he went to trial, was found guilty, he spent two years in, 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 a, uh, in, in a prison. Um, 
So the cause of death was a drug overdose. The manner of death was homicide in this case. I gave you three examples from my book. Like I said, there are about 20 more, but I, uh, I will leave that for you to read in the future. I thought what I'll do now is maybe uh, give you some examples from uh, you know, real life cases that I was involved with. So you can see how the, uh, the process works, the litigation process works. Um, so for example, and I will start with these, an easy one, an easy case. So in this case, it was a, uh, what we call a drunk driving, uh, uh, a drunk driving case, which is, uh, 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 in, in this case, somebody died. Uh, so it's called a vehicular homicide. And, uh, and the driver who caused the accident, uh, you know, was, sent to, was, was arrested. And, and I was hired by the state to be their expert, their toxicology expert. And then I went to, you know, I did, I did a number of reviews beforehand, but then eventually I wound up going to court and testifying in court. So here's what happened. And then I'll tell you, uh, here's what led to the, uh, to the trial. And, and then I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through the process. So, um, So the, the, sometime about 7.30 at night, uh, 7.30 at night the, uh, in January, um, this, this, this driver, okay, he's, he's driving and um, he, I guess he came back from work and he first stopped at a bar and then, and then he drove home. And, and when he drove, um, there came a certain point in time that he swerved off the road. So if, you, so if you can imagine that the road is two lanes, one in each direction, and he's in the right lane. So he's going, you know, let's say forward and the, the uh, other lane is going, you know, towards you. So, so he's driving and uh, he swerves towards the left. So that means he crosses. So in the United States, there are two lanes, and there's a yellow line between the two lanes. So he crosses the yellow line towards the left, once up, you know, on, on the grass alongside the left lane, and then he tries to get back on the road from the grass. And as he gets back on the road, he crashes with another car. And the other car is driven by a 17-year-old boy. Uh, I, I believe it was 17, and, and, and he died at the scene. Okay. So, um, so, so he's driving, crossing the road to the left, gets back on the road, but not watching where he's going, crashes into the oncoming car, and, and uh, there's the accident, and the other driver is, dies. And so now the police come, and they... Uh, and to investigate and they give him a test and they find that he has a blood alcohol level of 0.21. So in the United States, 0 0.08 is the uh, legal limit for driving under the influence of alcohol. And 0 0.08 is about two glasses of, of wine, for example, or, or, or beer. Um, and he had 0.21, which is almost three times as much. Okay, so so now he's um, he's arrested, and he's, and they find 0.21, so that he is over the legal limit for alcohol, um, which is basically driving under the influence of alcohol. That's the UI, driving under the influence of alcohol. And, and, um, and, uh, and so now the question is, uh, he, he goes to trial to figure out what, you know, 
to find him you know, guilty or innocent in, in, in the accident and also what the, uh, you know, what the penalty should be. Okay. So, so to do that, so he presents his case and the state of which I was their expert in, in toxicology present our side. And so, so what you have to do is to, uh, for every one of, of his arguments, you have to be able to counter his argument uh, and show that it's, it's, it's not correct. So for example, um, for example, he said, he said, he admitted that he went to the bar, but he said he only had a couple of beers. And, a, and so our argument in return is, first of all, two beers is not going to give you 0.21. Uh, that requires about somewhere between five and seven beer, uh, drinks. And, uh, <clears throat> and besides that, we, we also got a copy of the receipt at the bar where it showed that he, you know, he drank more like five or seven beers. Uh, so we were able to discount that argument that he had a 0.21 and it wasn't due to his, what he claimed was only two beers. He, then another argument that he had was that he swerved off the road uh, because a deer was crossing the road. So he was trying to avoid the deer. Um, that argument also was discounted by a um, by another expert, a a uh, accident rec uh, reconstruction expert, who basically said um, one that there was no evidence of deer crossing on that day. There was no evidence of a deer colliding with his car, and there's no evidence that uh, on the road that uh, that he swerved you know there's no tire marks showing that he swerved there's just uh you know there's no pressure marks due to brakes it just showed that he drifted you know he just drifted from one from one lane to the, you know to the next he did not actually swerve so we discounted all of that <clears throat> so so now what you have is this accident you have an alcohol level that you can uh, identify. And of course, we can then talk about, uh, based on the scientific literature, we can say what, what sort of, uh, what sort of um, side effects you will get from a 0 0.2, 0 0.21 alcohol level, what, what it does to your body. For example, uh, you, know, you lose your reflexes, your, your eyes are affected, your, uh, you know, you could be sedated, you can be falling asleep at the wheel and, and, and other things. So, so we talk about the, the effect of, of a blood alcohol level, specifically a 0.21 based on the scientific literature. We know that he did not swerve. We know that he had at least five or six, seven beers, which is consistent with our calculation for his, for his blood, blood alcohol level at the time of the accident because his, his blood was taken at, at the emergency room, which was about an hour later. So then you have to calculate backwards, so which we're able to do. So we can, we can figure out how much he had alcohol at the time of the accident, and that it was all consistent with the number of beers that, that, were, that he bought at, at the bar. So taking all that information together, the jury found him guilty, and then he went to jail. Any questions? Uh, All right, so, so, okay, so we'll move on. The, um, I'll give you another case. <clears throat> this is a case, <clears throat> this is a case of a, uh, a patient, a 50 year old, somewhere in his fifties, a man who went into the hospital, he would, you know, with, uh, nausea and vomiting and, and some back pain. Uh, and uh, he had that, that, that were considered related to his diabetes. So 
He went into the hospital and they treated him. So he had nausea and vomiting, right? So they couldn't give him a medication orally uh, because you know, you, you're vomiting. So you can't keep the drug you know, in your system. So, so instead they gave him uh, morphine intravenously to take care of the pain. So they gave him, uh, this is in the hospital. They gave him uh, morphine intravenously to take care of the pain. Uh, two, three days later, his pain is improved. His pain is improved. His, um, his nausea and vomiting stopped. So now he can go home. But uh, since he needed his morphine to, to take home, and he couldn't take home intravenous morphine, they had to, uh, before they, before they discharge him to go home, they had to switch him from intravenous morphine to an oral dose of morphine. Okay, so, so basically uh, there's, a, there's a process for doing that. There's a calculation for doing that that's, that's recommended by the manufacturer. How, how to, you know, for every milligram, let's say, of intravenous, how many milligrams of the oral you give. Uh, and then, so you, you know, you substitute one for the other until you finally do not give the intravenous, you only have the oral, and then you can go home. Okay, so uh, now what was the problem? The problem was that, um, like I said, three days after he was admitted, he was feeling better. Five days after he was admitted, they found him in the bathroom dead. Okay, so now the question is, why did he die? And, uh, and who's at fault? So the family sued the doctor and the hospital, and I was the family's expert. The argument was uh, that the, the assumption was, which I, which I proved, uh, was that he died from a morphine overdose. And, and how did that happen? Well, first of all, I told you that the manufacturer of the morphine uh, has information, gives information to the doctors how to switch from an intravenous dose to an oral dose, how much to give. Uh, so as you reduce the intravenous, you give the oral until you don't give uh, any intravenous at all, and then just have the oral, and then you can go home. The problem here was, so I reviewed the medical records from the hospital, and of course I reviewed the scientific literature, and uh, as well as information from the manufacturer. And basically what we saw was, in, instead, of, instead of giving the oral and taking away some of the intravenous, he gave the oral and the intravenous. He, and not only that, he kept increasing the oral without taking away the intravenous. So by the end of five days, five days after he was admitted to the hospital, the doctor has give, had given the patient seven times the amount of morphine combined, seven times as much morphine as he did on the first day. And by then it was in the overdose range. So he died from morphine. Not only that, did you understand all that? The, instead of taking away, adding one and taking the, away the other, he, he, he kept one, he kept the intravenous and kept adding more, more oral. So to, together it became seven times as much by, by day five, uh, seven times as much as what he gave him on day one. So but now it was in the overdose range. Not only that, the, uh, one of the side effects of uh, morphine is uh, constipation. So they found him in the bathroom and uh, <clears throat> they found him in, sitting on the toilet and, and the, um, with, with what we call a hard stool in the toilet. So basically what hard stool it means that he was constipated and he was constipated, it, it probably, probably what happened was he was sitting on the toilet and he was pressing very hard. And when he was pressing hard to go to the toilet, it puts pressure on the heart. And de depending how it goes, it, you know, you can get, depending how your heart is and so on and so on, 
uh, is then causing arrhythmia. And arrhythmia is an electrical abnorm abnormality in the heart, which in turn can cause death. And the assumption is this is probably what happened. So he, he because he got too much morphine, which was overdose, which was, you know, a very large amount. It, 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 the side effect is constipation. They found him in the bathroom with a hard stool and he died on, 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 the, on the toilet. So it all tends to point to the fact, co combine the clinical science as well as the medical records that show that he gave him too much, all seems to show um, an overdose or too much morphine. Now, I just want to I just want to uh, point out one thing is that when you testify when you testify in court, um, you're not testifying that saying that it's uh, that what you're saying is absolutely correct. In other words, there's no room for error. It, it's uh, it's not like you know saying beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, no. What you're testifying is that it's more likely than not that the science and that the information supports your opinion. What does that mean? <clears throat> when you say more likely than not, it means that 51% or more of the scientific information supports your opinion. Not 100%, but 51% or more. 50% would be as likely as not less than 50 would be unlikely. So it has to be at least 51%. And of course, there's no way to measure, but, but you look at all the information that you have, and obviously you don't have all the information. There's always the possibility that it was a, a coincidence, you know, but you discount the, for example, you discount in this case that he died from, from his um, diabetes. And you discount uh, in this case, that he had you know, other diseases, for example, or that somebody killed him, or, or that he fell, or anything like that. And then, and then you look at the information that you have, which is uh, the medical records, you know, which tell you that he got too much morphine, the, the heart stool, which is a clinical sign of morphine intoxication, and then the uh, scientific literature, which tells you that the constipation puts a pressure on the heart that can cause an arrhythmia, and he died in 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 the toilet. So so it's all it all kind of fits together to to, to make a, a plausible scientific story uh, that more likely than not this is what happened. It's it's not an absolute uh, conclusion because there may be something you don't know about, but based on what you know, this is what it appears to be. And of course, the other side they can poke holes on your assumptions and see. You know, if they can do, if they can do it, but uh, if they can come up with a different explanation, but in this case they could not, and then and the doctor and the hospital were found guilty, um, and and in that case it's a civil case, so that means it's it's not prison. It means it's money, and in this case they they had to pay three hundred thousand dollars, which is the maximum allowed in that state for a civil case. So I think maybe, unless you have other ideas, I think maybe we'll stop here. Yes, sir, if you are uh, done from your side, we can definitely, if you have anything more to share with us. <clears throat> Do I have anything to share with you about what? About the talk anymore, or we can, the questions uh, from the chat box that we had from the participants. I can give you one more case if you're interested. Is that a yes? Hello? Yes, sir. I said I can give you one more case if, you, if you're interested. I can definitely ask this from the participants if they are uh, interested. We can have one more quick case discussion. Okay. Uh, there is a yes from everybody's side, sir. So you can uh, definitely share 
and then we can uh, take the questions from the participants. Okay, I'll, I'll give you one more case and then we'll go to questions. Sure, sir. So this other case, okay, so this other case, again, it's a driving case. So you have to uh, picture, uh, picture it in your mind that this is a big, in the United States, everything is big. So it's a three lanes, three lane highway. Um, and the driver is on the left lane. <clears throat> He's in the left lane and uh, <clears throat> it's about five o'clock in the morning. And, uh, and then one of, his one of the tires on his car one of the tires has a puncture and it goes out. So he slowly is moving from the left lane across three lanes to the right. So he can, so he can put his car, you know, up, uh, on the right shoulder. Okay. So, he, so he's driving at five o'clock in the morning, the left lane has a blowout of his tire. Slowly he's moving from left to right to, in order to get on the, on, the, on the side of the road. But as he's doing that, somebody hit, hits him, okay? Um, and the driver with the, who was moving from left to right, he has many injuries. So, you would think that the, the car behind him that hit him, they would be at, it would be their fault because, you know, he's moving from left to right and they are behind him. They, sh they, they see what's going on, so they should not hit him. But the car behind him, um, they sued the driver. Uh, of the of the car in, in front, because when the, I told you that the driver of the car in front he, he suffered many injuries. So when he went to the hospital, they always do bl uh, blood and urine uh, testing. And when they looked at the when the other driver's lawyer <clears throat> looked at the medical records of the of the of the driver of the car that had the flat tire, he saw that the urine had marijuana, marijuana and cocaine. So now they're trying to say, well, it's his fault because he was under the influence of uh, these two drugs. He had these two drugs in the system and uh, which of course you're not supposed to drive under the influence of drugs. So I was his expert. <clears throat> to say that he was not under the influence of drugs when the accident occurred. Because you see, if he was found guilty, then the other driver who hit him would be, you know, would not have any financial consequences. Um, so, so one, they looked at, they always look at blood and blood usually they look, they didn't find any drugs again, in the emergency room, they look at blood, didn't find any, any uh, drugs. And, and more importantly, there was no alcohol in his blood. So he was not what we call impaired by alcohol. <clears throat> okay. Then they look at, at the urine and they found, I told you, marijuana and cocaine. But I also told you before that what's in the urine is not, you know, that's outside the body and it's not, um, it's not indicative of how much is in the blood or when those drugs were taken. So uh, it doesn't tell you anything about when they were taken, how much was in, in the blood. And therefore, if you don't know how much was in the blood, you don't know what the effect might be uh, on the person who, who, uh, who had 
these two drugs in his urine. So for example, he, he could have had these drugs in his urine, but but he would have he could have taken it like maybe even a week earlier because it takes it takes time to for the body to eliminate drugs from you know from the blood. And some, some drugs can take even as long as a week or five or six, seven days. So, so that's the first thing uh, that the um, that the urine values, the urine inflammation was not helpful to the other side. Plus, if he had those drugs in his blood, and theoretically, uh, if theoretically he had these drugs in his blood, then then they would have caused him to have certain symptoms, and yet he didn't exhibit any of those symptoms that you expect from cocaine or marijuana. Um, so, uh, you know, just for example, you know, you can have euphoria, you can have uh, changes in mood and perception, you can have impairment of coordination. He didn't have any of that, you know? And that was the clinical signs that he exhibited did not support an effect by these two drugs. And, and not only that, like I said, the, the drugs were in his urine, which, which uh, you know, which is, uh, which doesn't tell you anything about when the drugs were taken or how much was in his blood. So, uh, so I pointed all that out. And I also pointed out, so basic, basically I pointed out based on the examination of the, of the medical records, I pointed out based on the examination of scientific literature, uh, on these two drugs and their effects. Um, and I pointed out this, you know, the absence of clinical science. Um, so altogether, so this is basically what we do as toxicologists is what I'm saying, is that you, you in a case like this, you look at the medical records, you look at the scientific literature, if there's a police report, you look at the police report, you see uh, what the, you know, the policeman on, on the scene um, what he found, what he saw. Um, and then you take all that information together and you make a scientific case, which is what I did. And so he, uh, and, and, and so the driver of the car th that was sued the, uh, with, a uh, with a flat tire, um, he was not found guilty because, uh, because there was not sufficient evidence to implicate that he was under the influence of any drug. Okay, let's go to questions now. Uh, sure, sir. Thank you so much uh, for sharing uh, such a knowledgeable and insightful, uh, like uh, no, uh, information from your experience. I'll definitely take up the questions from the chat box. And if anybody want to ask the question uh, directly, they can raise their hand, I'll allow them to speak. Okay, so uh, we have one raised hand from uh, Dr. D.S. Badukar. I'll just allow you, sir, to speak up. I'll request you to unmute yourself, sir. Okay, thank you. My question is to Dr. Harry, that uh, how many drugs were identified from the various samples of uh, Michael Jackson, apart from propofol? In, in Michael Jackson's case? <clears throat> It's, it's I, I believe it's uh, again it's in my book, but I believe it's it was uh, three other drugs. Yeah, propofol was one. Yeah, I'll um, just give me a second. I'll tell you exactly. Okay. Okay, so we had uh, he had three, yeah, three drugs, just like I said. He had uh, three different tranquilizers. Yeah. Besides, besides propofol, he had three different tranquilizers. Yes. Of which category? These tranquilizers? Which tranquilizers? Yeah. Can you he name had, uh, some? Yeah. So he had <clears throat> lorazepam. Yeah. Um, he had uh, midazolam. Yeah. And and they had uh, low levels of lidocaine. 
and uh, one second thing you said uh, uh, a case uh, of a morphine overdose right so i have uh, to say that when iv morphine even given along with oral or even if oral is not given the morphine is excreted in stomach right and since it causes a constipation it is reabsorbed so it may lead to cumulative effect also <clears throat> I'm sorry, was there a question? No, you said that there was overdose of morphine in one case, right? Which led to constipation and uh, cardiac arrhythmias. So yes. So that overdosing may be because of non-excretion of uh, morphine. Because when we give morphine IV, it is excreted in the stomach and it is again reabsorbed. And since the patient is constipated, right? It is not excreted. Yeah, well, the, uh, yeah, no, that's a good point. The, the, uh, the, the fact that he had high amounts of, of uh, morphine is, yeah. uh, is, no, is known from the medical records. Yeah. Because we see in the medical records exactly what he, what he was given. And I, I think I mentioned that by the last day, he gave seven times as much as they wanted. So, so, um, so, so he didn't die. He didn't die from respiratory depression, right? He, most likely, he again. I can't. I can't make such definitive statements. But most likely, he did not die from respiratory depression. He died from uh, an arrhythmia. Because overdose of morphine could have led to respiratory uh, respiratory depression, and could right. have died. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, thank you so much, sir, for answering the question. If you'll allow me, I'll take a few more questions. Uh, hello, sir, can we take a few more questions from the chat box? I hope I'm audible, Harry, sir. Uh, yes, often you can take a few questions. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so we have one question from uh, Dr. Vikas Arbi. He says that uh, without permission for the autopsy by the relative, how come the medical examiner conduct the investigation and gave the cause of death? So he's talking about Carrie Fisher, right? Yes. Uh, I guess he's talking about the same case. Right. So he didn't, he didn't do an autopsy. Right, he, he just did a CAT scan, uh, which is permit, permitted. Um, and and he and he didn't, uh, you know, he didn't take samples at the, at the autopsy. He, you know, he got samples from the hospital. So so he can do all that. Uh, I think it's very consistent with the uh, with the family not giving permission for an autopsy uh, because he didn't do an autopsy and he didn't do toxicology on blood and urine taken at, at autopsy. We did it on, on samples that were taken, you know, at the hospital. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for the answer. Uh, we have one more question from uh, Felipe. Uh, person is asking that, uh, please enlighten me on what are the common internal organ to be investigated in drug overdose. Then the question has another part also. How do you see the symptoms of drug overdose in autopsy? <clears throat> right. So the okay. Uh, so the, in terms of the second part, uh, how do you see symptoms at autopsy? Well, obviously the, the obviously the patient is dead, so you don't see any symptoms. So, uh, but but what you do is you look at the medical records, and that that put. You know the medical records, any police reports, uh, any any sort of written records, depending on the situation, uh, whether there's any sort of a description in over there uh, of clinical signs. Uh, so, uh, so that's why that's where you see the clinical signs. And 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 at autopsy, when you get the when you do the toxicology analysis, uh, and you see. You know, a high level of drugs, 
for example, let's say morphine, and and then and then you do your scientific review to see what how what those kind of levels of morphine does. Um, then then you compare what you know based on scientific literature from those kind of levels with what you actually saw with, as written in the in clinical science as as written in the medical records and and in uh, in police reports and, and in the other records. And then you see if they kind of mesh. Um, the, as, far as, as far as what other organs, well, <clears throat> um, when they do an autopsy, uh, obviously one, one major organ is the heart uh, to, see, to see if there's any uh, heart enlargement, if there's any atherosclerosis, uh, hardening of the arteries. Um, that's what that's that's usually like the, you know the, the main organ that you're concerned about. There's also the brain, for example. Are there any any tumors in the brain uh, that might explain behavior? Um, there's and, and obviously you know kidneys now, and and sometimes so. If, for example, if the kidneys are not functioning properly, that can explain why the why the amount in the blood of, of certain drugs is elevated. So looking at all that kind of information uh, is important in order to be able to then blend all that information together, both in terms of the autopsy results, the toxicology results, clinical science, and any uh, information you have about the circumstances surrounding the death. And then you blend it all together to see if it all makes sense into a scientific story. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your answer. I can uh, definitely say that uh, the person must have got the answer for their for uh, his question. And then we have one more question from S K Chakrabarti. Uh, he's he want to ask, uh, sir, that as you have discussed that, uh, as you said that undetermined cause of death, like you have talked about that. So how much does it affect the prosecution? Like how much it could be? Uh, like it will be affecting the prosecution part. In the case of the undetermined cause of death. How, how does the prosecution, uh, how does cause of death affect prosecution? Is that what you're saying? Yes, uh, the person is asking that uh, in the cases of undetermined cause of death. Und uh, okay, und und there is no undetermined cause of death. Yes. There's only undetermined manner of death. Okay. So cause of death. Cause of death, they have to identify a cause of death. It's the manner of death that is undetermined. The, as I mentioned to you, the manner of death can either be natural, accident, homicide, suicide, and undetermined. So I'll just give you one, I'll, I'll just give you a, a quick uh, other example uh, uh, from, from my book, and that would be uh, I'm not going to give you the whole the whole story, but I'll but I'll tell you. Uh, Natalie Wood, uh, if, if you remember Natalie Wood, you know, many years ago was a beautiful actress and she died by drowning. So like I said, I'm not gonna give you all the details, but I'll tell you that two different medical examiners, two different uh, highly professional, well-educated, uh, well-respected medical examiners looked at the, the same information about what happened the, the uh, autopsy and anything else, they looked at the same information, but, but they came at two different conclusions for the manner of death. They both agreed that, it, that she died by drowning. Okay, that's the cause of death. But on the manner of death, the first, the first uh, medical examiner concluded it was an accident. And the second one, about uh, 15 years later or so, concluded that it was a uh, undetermined. Okay, so here we are, two medical examiners, both highly respected, looking at exactly the same information, come up with two different conclusions because the manner of death is, uh, is an interpretation, whereas the cause of death is very scientific based on facts. So they both concluded she died from drowning, but the manner of death, one said accident, the other one said undetermined. What does that mean? Well, accident, 
you know, from the prosecution side, accident means, this, you know, the case is over. It was an accident. Undetermined means, well, it could have been a homicide. So now, you know, the case is still open. It, after all these years, the case is still open and her in Natalie Wood's death with this suggestion, although never proven, that a husband was involved in her in her death. So but potentially, if, if it's correct, potentially it was a homicide, but they have no way of proving it. So uh, I hope that it answers you. But uh, manner of death is a is a legal medical interpretation of all the information. And when you get undetermined, it leaves the case open. Uh, definitely, sir. We have the answer for the question. And uh, do we have any more questions? Uh, like uh, if you want directly, any participants, you can raise your hand. I'll allow you to speak. Uh, so there's, uh, till then, there's one more question in the chat box from Diksha Mehra. She's asking that, is it true that uh, the body of Michael Jackson uh, was having many injecting sites? Also that he used to take various other drugs for skin whitening and muscle work. <clears throat> okay. So, so uh, that's the story, right? That's what you hear. <clears throat> that's what you hear. <clears throat> But realistically, what happened in the past, that is to say before he died, has nothing to do with the day of death, okay? So whether or not he has, and I put that in quotation marks because obviously if you're taking drugs for a long time, it affects your you know, internal organs. It could affect your internal organs, but in terms of cause of death, what happens in the past is probably unrelated. Uh, what we're really interested in is, uh, you know, what they find in the autopsy, which is as close to death as possible, uh, usually within 12 hours, and, uh, and 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 that's where they find, uh, in this case, you know, the drugs, and and you know, and they didn't find any other possible any other possible causes. So the fact that he may have take, been taking drugs in the past, for example, by injection or otherwise that may or may not have affected his internal organs, but realistically at autopsy, they didn't find anything unusual about his internal organs. So uh, so it probably was unrelated. I'm sure it was unrelated to his death. What, what was related is the, is, is the circumstances of his death, as well as the different uh, concentrations of drugs that they found in his body. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for giving your time and uh, sharing your experience. Uh, with the permission of Ranjit, sir, and you, uh, can we proceed, sir, further? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Yes, Afrin, we can close the session for the day. Thank yes. you so much. So I must say, it's a wonderful session, sir. Yes, sir, it was a wonderful session. I'll request my co-host Asa Verma to give a vote of thanks to Harry sir and the participants. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir, for enriching us with such deep thoughts and understanding about the deaths of famous people like Carrie Fisher, Marilyn Monroe, and Natalie Woods, as well as Michael Jackson. A uh, case of drunk driving as well as a 50-year-old uh, patient of overdose of morphine. It was also great to know how you chose biological sciences over electrical engineering and jumping over to writing your first novel. It was indeed an insightful talk. Now, I request my co-host, Afrin Tarunno, ma'am, to, uh, to present a token of uh, appreciation for your efforts. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Asta. I'll request uh, Harry, sir, to... Uh, like accept this uh, e-certificate from our side as a token of appreciation for delivering such an insightful uh, talk on the uh, topic uh, that is forensics, the science behind the death of the famous people. Thank you so much, Harry, sir. We are uh, very much enlightened with your talk. We are very much uh, like happy to hear from you because you have shared many things from your experiences uh, that actually I would be saying that Many of you are not uh, actually aware about that. So thank you so much, Harry, sir, for being with us for today's session. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. <clears throat> I, I'm glad that it was, it was a learning experience for everybody. And uh, 
I really enjoyed it. I, and I will tell you that <clears throat> many people have, you know, have read my book and they asked me to write another one. So I'm writing a sequel now and it's going to be called Forensics 2, The Science Behind the Deaths of Famous and Infamous People. So it's going to be uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, as they say, in, in the United States. So that's, that's going to be uh, available probably in about, about eight months to a year. Thank you so much, sir. We will be uh, eagerly waiting for your uh, second part of the books, uh, book of forensics. And definitely, this is going to be uh, very beneficial for the students of the forensic science because uh, they will be definitely learning from your experience. So, uh, with the permission of uh, Ranjit and Hari, sir, we are at the end of the session. So, if you, uh, if you allow me, I'll be uh, just ending the meeting for the day. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Afrin, and I request all the participants. We are going to organize a first biennial symposium on rescue rights and dignity of the dead. That is going to be on 23rd and 24th. I have shared the registration link in the chat box. I request all of you to register in that particular symposium. Thank you so much, Afrin. Thank you, Harry. Thank you for thank giving you. your time. Thank you so thank much, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> So with the permission of Ranjit sir and Harris sir, I'm uh, just ending the session for the day. I'll request all the participants, you can download your certificate uh, from our official website, that is forensicevents.com. 